Well, it's wonderful to be here, and I just want to thank everyone um, for yesterday's wonderful discussions. Um, many of you are from business schools, which has just been, um, and many of you uh, represent different disciplines, and I, I love interdisciplinary conversations, so really feel like some of the talks took my mind to places it hadn't been before in a wonderful way. Robin, uh, as she said, is an alum of Smith College and asked me to um, speak about women's colleges kind of generally in the context of, uh, I will say, disruption or um, how to use the master's tools for, to promote a women's equality. And I thought about what to call this, and the reason I'm calling it not a cloister is that I spent 18 years at Harvard, and when I made the decision to, to leave Harvard to go be the president of Smith, my Harvard friends were not actually very supportive. And a number of them said things like, don't you think women's colleges are anachronistic? And I said, well, obviously not, because I'm going there. Um, but um, don't you think women's colleges are cloisters? And it may be that they were originally. I'm going to talk somewhat about the history of women's colleges, but they're anything but that now. So I'm going to talk about women's colleges um, as an intervention, which is what I think they are. Here's kind of an overview of the talk. I'm going to give some background. I'm going to talk about a little bit about gender equality today and then how I think women's colleges are dismantling the master's house and a little bit about the work uh, ahead. And there's a lot of work ahead, and some of that has been previewed by some of the other talks. So I'm going to mostly focus on the seven sisters um, because I have the most interactions with them. There are really only five. Vassar is co-ed but still attends seven sister meetings, and we can't decide whether we should call them seven sibling meetings. So maybe, maybe you um, can advise us about that. And Harvard, of course, is a research institute now. Um, but, and they do not participate in, in seven sister meetings, although we would welcome them if they wanted to. But they're just so different. Background. Um, in this section, I'm just going to give you a very brief history of the founding of women's colleges and what motivated them. So here are the dates. Uh, Mount Holyoke was the first in 1837. And you can see that came Vassar, Smith, Wellesley the same year, uh, Radcliffe, and um, Bryn Mawr. So um, this was really a 19th century phenomenon. Um, and there was just a burst of activity once Mount Holyoke decided to do what it did. Maybe some of you have heard that Emily Dickinson really had, her brother went to Amherst. There was really no choice for where she could go. She went to women, Mount Holyoke for a while, but it was mostly a seminary. So she dropped out because she decided she didn't believe in God. And um, she's written really um, very compellingly about this. Um, Vassar went co-ed in 1969, and today it's 62% female. But as I said, they still feel their connection to the women's colleges. Um, Harvard became co-ed in 1946. There was a Radcliffe, um, but it merged with Harvard officially in 1999. But even in 1950, women and men were making, um, were taking classes together. Barnard uh, is a college of Columbia, but it has legal and financial autonomy. And for those of you who are a lot younger than I am, this might surprise you, but the Ivies went co-ed, except for Harvard, I would say, relatively late. Dartmouth in 1972, and uh, Columbia in 1983. Columbia was all men until 1983. So when the Ivies went co-ed, it really posed a problem, I think, for women's colleges. Like, what is our purpose? What is our focus now? We used to be kind of the Ivies for women. And I think for a while they lost their way, but women's colleges have certainly bounced back with a vengeance. Um, so there's a wonderful book about women's colleges that Helen Horowitz, uh, published in 1984. She's a historian who taught at Smith. And um, the title of the book is Alma Mater. So here's a quote from it. How did the creators of these colleges conceive of the communities of women that they called into being? These educational pioneers boldly offered women the liberal arts, which had previously been denied to the sex. They courageously claimed a male preserve for women. So women went to kind of colleges that were basically um, finishing schools. And what Helen is saying here is that the world of ideas became available to women. You know, uh, previously, I don't think I'm making some of this up, but women went to finishing schools where they studied things like penmanship, literature, French, decorative arts, needlework. So the women's colleges, I mean, there were some state colleges, of course, where women were welcome, but um, 
Women's colleges were a, a novel idea with respect to access. They also were with respect to agency. I, I love this, but Mary Lyon, who created Mount Holyoke, she wanted to turn daughters who were acted upon into women capable of self-propelled action. So that's different too, right? We're seeing different notions of conceptions of women that came with the establishment of women's colleges. Jill Kerr Conway, one of my heroes, she was actually the first woman president of Smith. Some women's colleges had women presidents all the way along. Smith didn't until 1975. And um, I think Jill's spin was really, what does it mean to have women at the center? So she wrote, uh, in these institutions, the situation for women clearly is not only favorable but empowering. The education of women is the primary purpose of the institution. There is a critical mass of women faculty. Women are nurtured and challenged in all realms, and women-related issues dominate campus discussions. In short, at these colleges, the total development of women is taken seriously by the entirety of the community. And you know, that's the main thing that I would say. You know, having spent most of my career at two co-educational institutions, um, University of New Hampshire and Harvard, it just feels different at Smith. And I have to tell you, I love Harvard. I, I grew up on the outskirts of Harvard. I grew up in Medford. I spent time in the psychology department at the School of Education. I am not um, being disrespectful to Harvard, which is a place that I love. But at Smith, everyone takes for granted in a deeper way that women can lead. That's really it. It's just, even when I got there, even like you know the 72-year-old curmudgeons in you know, poli sci or something, nobody questioned. Uh, that I was the leader. And I think people did question me as a, a woman dean at Harvard. I should say this too. Harvard has, what, 10 professional schools in a college? In 2005, I made the dean of the School of Education. I am the fifth woman dean in Harvard history. That's it. Five. And three of us were deans of the School of Education. Elena Kagan was the fourth, I believe. I came after her. So, so for those of you who are young, you know, I, I'm going to sound like a dinosaur, but um, things have really changed during my generation in, in dramatic ways. Okay, we haven't really talked about gender equity much in this conference. I'm just going to give you a few, maybe because we all know them, but just, um, just a few facts. Women are still dramatically underrepresented in many areas. In STEM, only 27% of the STEM workforce is women. In business, only 24% have C-suite roles. In Congress, 27% of congressional seats are held by women. Nine state governors are women. And I thought I would point out, because this came up yesterday with respect to op-eds in journalism, 31% of uh, AP and Reuters bylines are by women, 31%. So the rest by men. Um, the situation is far worse when you're talking about black women, indigenous women, Latinx women, and Asian women, right? Dramatically less. So many of these C-suite women are, in fact, white. And um, it's worth saying that COVID has exacerbated this underrepresentation because women have disproportionately left not only the workforce, uh, but the leadership ladder, which is something I think we need to care about. With respect to the gender pay gap, Women make 84% of what men earn. I just have to tell you, it's nice for me that um, the Chronicle publishes salaries. And a couple of years ago, I said to um, my board chair, you know, of the top 10 liberal arts college presidents, um, the top earners are all men except for Biddy Martin. Just saying. And I, I did get a salary adjustment, which was um, very, very nice. I, I appreciated that. But the other thing about this gap, the 84%, um, the um, is that it's unchanged in the last 15 years, completely stable. So more work to be done there. And um, one of the things I like to talk about as a psychologist is cultural invisibility. Um, women just aren't visible in the same way with respect to our culture. I love independent films, so I thought I'd talk about the Bechdel test. How many of you know about the Bechdel test? Okay, I would say maybe a quarter of you, but Alison Bechtel, who's wonderful, we gave her an honorary degree at Smith College a while ago, said in order to pass her test, a film must have two female characters who talk to each other about something other than a man. 
It happens less than half the time in Oscar Best Picture winners, and there have been a number of studies using the Bechtel test. It really uh, doesn't happen very often, um, even in films that we all love. So something for us to think about. Okay, so at women's colleges, you know, we, we are continually talking about um, gender equity and um, talking about the fact, um, well, these are places that gave birth to women like Gloria Steinem, right? So who's a, a proud Smith alumna? She just turned 88 and she's doing great. But with respect to what happened, you know, um, when the Ivies went co-ed, I think applications to women's colleges did go down. But in the, um, the last 15 years, they are going up, up, up everywhere. On our campus in the last eight years, they are up 63% applications. Um, and some of us are attributing this to the Trump bump, some of us to the Me Too movement. But I think it's more than that. I think women in STEM are attracted to women's colleges because they've read about. That's the area where you see the most gender discrimination in the classroom, and there are studies of this. And one of the, we have a new communications person, and um, we start thinking about, will there come a point where we don't need women's colleges anymore? I don't know the answer to that, but what she said is, well, we're still here because we're not there. And I just love that. I mean, don't you love communications people? We're still here because we're not there. So, <laughs> yeah, that's why we're here. We can talk about the end of women's colleges um, when, we're, when there's no gender differentiation, I guess. Okay. So uh, it was really fun to think about dismantling the master's house. And so I, I, I'm going to first talk about the world as it is now, and then I'm going to pivot a little bit to talk about um, what we want and, and how we might dismantle it. So like a lot of you, I went back to Audre Lorde. I like this quote. Um, some, one of you might have used this yesterday, too. What does it mean to dismantle the master's house? It's learning how to stand alone, unpopular, and sometimes reviled. I want to emphasize that. It's been really hard to be a woman with men putting you down sometimes for asking what you know is right. You know, it, it, it hurts sometimes. And how to make common cause with those other identified as outside the structures in order to define and seek a world in which we can all flourish. So I really love this notion about make a common cause with others, which made me think about uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, who invented the term intersectionality. Again, this was a topic that you and others talked about yesterday that I really appreciated. Kimberly is somebody we also gave an honorary degree to since I've been at Smith. But she coined this term more than 30 years ago and described it as a lens or a prism for seeing the world in which various forms of inequality operate together and exacerbate each other. So inequality based on race, gender, class, which we haven't talked too much about, although Rakesh, you did. Um, and immigrant status, LBGTQ, and so on. And one of the things I want to say about women's colleges is I was struck right away that intersectionality is in the DNA, at least at Smith. I can't speak for all of them. But our students are committed to DEI work. They're committed to LGBTQ rights and expansive definitions of women in admission. Um, my second year, we decided to admit trans women, and we admit people who identify as gender non-conforming women and so on. I'm sure we'll talk more about that. But we also have programs for, um, for women whose education was interrupted, at most of the women's colleges too. So we have a program where we have women who are 25, we've had women who are 75, who finish and study alongside um, 18 to 22 year olds. And then class, one of the things I want to tell you about Smith is that 62% uh, of our students receive financial aid. At most other, um, the top 20 kind of liberal arts colleges, it's more like 40, which means 60% of them are full pay. But I think it's back to this kind of DNA. We talk about um, accessibility for everyone. So let me talk a little bit about what I mean, and I said this in the title, about women's colleges being interventions. I've got three points that I want to make here. The first is that with respect to an intervention, they are inherently designed, I would say currently, let's just say in this century, as places that recognize and celebrate non-normative choices. So um, only 2% of college-going women consider applying to women's colleges, although I think that number is growing. And so when I think about who comes to women's colleges, it may be that we are already 
selecting for leaders and disruptors from the pools that we attract, um, which I think is great. I mean, it's one of the places, one of the reasons that I think women's colleges um, can serve as uh, disruptive entities. So trans men like to come to women's colleges, and you might think that that seems kind of counterintuitive. If you were, wanted to identify as a man, why would you want to come to a women's college? And it's because of these notions of intersectionality. It's because uh, they will have allies in even cis women, not, not even just gay women, but cis women at places like Smith. Um, women's colleges are interventions because of the role models. I can't even tell you how different it is to be at a place where all of the leaders just about are women. I mean, compare, I mean, again, compare that with what I was sharing a minute ago, where I can't tell you how many times I was the only woman in a, in a meeting, a search committee meeting, whatever kind of meeting when I was at Harvard. So of course, all of the seven sister presidents are women. The boards are predominantly women. Men is a, a minority group. We're always looking for a few good men. I think we have three on our board now. No, really, we, how can we find a man who would want to be on our board? But uh, Moisin Mastafavi, who used to be the dean of the design school, is on our on our board. And sometimes we do this um, intentionally. Um, I started a presidential colloquium series. And without talking about it, uh, 36 of the speakers who have come uh, have been women, two non-binary speakers, and 16 men, right? So it, it's just kind of, you notice it. It's not, it's subtle, but it's not subtle. Interestingly enough, on my campus, most of the buildings are named for men. And of course, as you can imagine, that's something I'm trying to change. So we put up a new apartment complex for seniors. And there were five buildings. And we didn't, I'm glad we didn't get donors for them, because we were trying to figure out who to name them for. So we named them for our first black graduate, our first Native American student, our first Middle Eastern student, our first Latinx student, our first Asian student. And the students loved it. Well, all of the student leadership positions are held by women. And mo I say mostly, because sometimes a trans uh, man might be. You probably saw the uh, New York Times story, The Men of Wellesley, maybe um, eight, nine years ago. I mean, there are men on campus. But if you look at who's the head of the Student Government Association, the newspaper, the honor board, it's typically women. And we try to amplify women's voices. We have a women in public service project where we have undergraduates publishing op-eds all the time in the local newspaper, in Ms. Magazine, and sometimes other places. And we have programs where our students co-construct knowledge with the faculty. So for example, we have something called pedagogical partners where students collaborate with faculty, give feedback to faculty. I mean, I just think these kinds of programs are interesting, and I don't think it's accidental that they tend to be at women's colleges. Well, what about post-graduation? We are working on that. We are working on having a, a, a network as powerful as the HBS network. And the HBS network is the most powerful career network I have ever come across. So we are stealing ideas wherever we can get them. Um, and we're also trying to transform organizational cultures. Um, some of, I think someone yesterday talked about um, the importance of um, career development as a, as a level to, to make the playing field more level. So we're, we are working on that, too. When you talk to a Smith alum about what they got out of Smith, and I, I did this my first year because I was on my listening tour practicing being an anthropologist, they say they found their voice at Smith and that they made lifelong friends at Smith. I mean, Robin's best friend from Smith is at this conference. So I know that this is true. But the finding the voice is really important. So our graduates go out and they don't care if they're the only woman in the room. They really know what it's like to, to use their voice because they've had practice doing it. So what about the work ahead? I have three bullets here, but um, last night I added two more. We continue to work on access and affordability. And for intersectional reasons, we eliminated loans from our financial aid packages last year because we looked at how much debt students took out as a factor of race. And when we saw how high it was for black students, and for Latinx students, that was it. The board was sold. This is a very expensive program, about $8 million a year, but, but we did it. Again, we're trying to make the network work for everybody. We are tr expanding our institutional partnerships. The last two things I want to talk to you about is we are doing a lot about women in business because my first year when I was busy being an anthropologist, the women who were successful in business told me that they were 
channeled away from careers in business. So we now have an innovation lab. We have a women's um, business network for alums. We, we actually have a leadership center, too, that's different from our innovation lab. And I hope that those um, make a big difference. And finally, because I know you're interested, I am too, what, <laughs> what does it mean to be a women's college when conceptions of gender have moved from binary to non-binary and have moved from static to fluid? What does it mean? We're talking a lot about that. At one point, I did a really interesting thing. I went to see um, the Massachusetts Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, and I asked him that question my second year, and he said to, to me, be the least discriminatory as possible. So that's good advice, but it'll only, it'll only take you so far. It'll only take you so far. So I look forward to hearing your thoughts about that and to hearing your questions. Thank you for your time and attention. Appreciate it. Thank you.